Good evening. Welcome to this very special, special talk, talk here tonight, tonight at the South Bank, Bank Centre. Mark, Mark Hollinger in conversation with Marina, Marina Warner. My name, My name is Tamsin Dillon. I'm London the head of the Art Underground. London Underground's um, world class programme of contemporary art, art that enriches the tube environment and um, um, continues, continues the long standing. Um, um, tradition, tradition of, of um, um, that, that art and design of the very excellent quality is at the core of London Underground's identity. This talk has been organised in relation to Mark Wallinger's Labyrinth, a huge project to commemorate the 150th anniversary of London Underground and culminating in a unique artwork um, in every one of the 270 stations on the network. I won't say any more about Labyrinth at this point, as it is the substance of the conversation to follow, except to mention that, um, as of today, 235 of the artworks are now installed, and all will be in situ by the end of January 2014. The public programme for Labyrinth has been an essential way of raising awareness of the project, and it's been very exciting to work with a wide range of collaborative organisations on this. Um, on this occasion, I want to really thank the South Bank Centre for working with us on this event, especially James Runcie and Sophie Sladen. And I'm now honoured to introduce our two very distinguished speakers. Mark Wallinger, born in Chigwell, Essex in 1959, is one of the UK's leading contemporary artists, his works include Sculpture Eke Homo from 1999, the first work chosen to be um, able to occupy the fourth plinth in Trafalgar Square, the permanent installation Via Dolorosa in the crypt of the Duomo in Milan, Cinema Amnesia 2012 outside Turner Contemporary in Margate, and State Britain 2007 at Tate Britain, for which he was awarded the 2007 Turner Prize, having previously been nominated in 1995. Mark represented Great Britain at the Venice Biennale in, in 2001 and has held solo exhibitions in the Serpentine Gallery in London, Tate Liverpool, Vienna Secession and the Palais de Beaux-Arts in Brussels. His work has recently been the subject of a major survey at the Museum de Pont in the Netherlands in 2011, and his latest solo exhibition, One, was in Derry, City of Culture 2013, earlier this autumn. Mark's work is displayed in collections of many leading international museums, including Tate, MoMA New York, and the Centre Pompidou in Paris. Marina Warner spent her early years in Cairo before studying modern languages in Oxford. She's an internationally acclaimed cultural historian, critic, novelist, and short story writer. Her non-fiction work, works include The Beast to the Blonde, No Go to the Bogeyman, Fantastic Metamorphoses, and the multi-prize winning Stranger Magic. While her fiction includes the novels The Lost Father, shortlisted for the Booker Prize, Indigo, and and, uh, Lito, and the Leto Bundle. Sorry, Marie. Sorry. Um, and short story collections, including Murderers I Have Known. She lectures widely in Europe, the United States, and the Middle East, and was appointed CBE in 2008. We're delighted to have Mark and Marina with us. Um, and I'm happy to tell you that there will be an opportunity to ask questions at the end. Thank you to you, the audience, for being here. Um, please do make sure your mobile phones are switched off. So um, now it's over to you, Marco Marina. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, um, Tamsin, for introducing us. Um, Mark Wallinger has the gift of creating significance without heaviness. His art as I'm sure many of you in this room know, comes in all shapes and sizes, presences and absences, modes and materials. And this varied work arises with agility, 
wit, and profound thoughtfulness from a well of examined living, looking, and reading. He pays absorptive attention to what is disturbing and possibly repellent as much as to what is appealing, expansive, and he creates epiphanies, often so subtly one hardly knows they're happening to one. I'm going to make him uncomfortable because while he uses himself, his personal history and formation and his ongoing existence as the raw material for making a great deal of his work, he is not autobiographical confessional, but turns himself into an object of inquiry alongside many others, just more conveniently to hand. <laughs> Doubting Thomas by Caravaggio captures a painting that he chose for the exhibition of the Russian Landsman, captures his curiosity, his no, actually, what didn't appear in the exhibition, <laughs> it appeared in the catalogue of the exhibition, um, is a kind of alter ego for him, Doubting Thomas. And it captures his curiosity, his, his respect and his awe for what might be discovered, what could be knowable. Perhaps not entirely to consciousness, not to consciousness only, but also to the unconscious. In a fierce polemical article he gave at a conference in 1998 and then printed in The Guardian, Mark wrote, artistic practice is the most critical practice. Artworks should engage, articulate, problematize, open new ways of seeing, place the viewer in jeopardy of their received opinions, move the artist to the limits of what they know or believe, excite, incite, entertain, annoy, get under the skin, and when you're done with them, nag at your mind to go take another look. And this uh, quote appears uh, in a collection of Mark's writings, which is at the end of the very splendid and large retrospective book here, um, called Mark, um, by Martin Herbert, with, um, that's gr uh, grown out of a lot of conversations and interviews with Mark um, Wallinger. So this manifesto has been borne out again and again over time since he wrote it by his work, just to single out a few pieces. Eke Homo, which um, we'll come back to, and which Townsend mentioned, the fourth plinth figure. State Britain, famous monumental piece, 2007. The Tate Britain reenactment, do you call it a reenactment or not quite? Um, simulacrum, maybe. Simulacrum, simulacrum, good word, yes of Brian Hawes persevering single stand outside the Houses of Parliament to protest against the Iraq War. And the subsequent law passed forbidding such demonstrations in that area. The Russian linesman two years later, a memorable, wonderful constellation of politics, aesthetics, sport, literature, which brought the question of boundaries into focus, physically in Israel, Cyprus, Berlin, and metaphorically. Where do we draw the line? Well, Labyrinth is his latest work of art, or rather works of art. Since 270, um, well, not quite, we heard, but have almost been installed in 270 stations on the tube. Um, and it wasn't all that easy, um, Mark has told me, to count the stations, should some of the phantom ones be included. And in a way, that would suit you, wouldn't it? <laughs> A few ghost stations. Um, I saw the first at Westminster, and it had immediately had an effect on, on the passers-by because the two women were tracing the path through the labyrinth. And that was quite a, a few weeks ago, in fact. I don't know when the first ones went up. So the, 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 as you heard from Tamsin, the whole piece was commissioned by Art on the Underground to commemorate 150 years of the tube system in London. And Mark has lived in the underground, one way or another, the full force of the metaphor too, since his childhood near the central line. And he's made earlier works inspired by the tube, which we'll come to. Underworlds and journeys are themes of, his great, of great inspiration to him um, and are connected to a book that is talismanic for you, um, Joyce's Ulysses, and beyond Joyce to Dante and to Homer. So we'll just quickly look through, but in the, uh, the one or two of these. We'll come back to them in more detail later, but just to show you, if you haven't already caught them, um, how, they, how some of them look. Now, which one is your home, <coughs> your home station? Have we got to... Well, you know, you, you, the 
if you go back one again, that you just lighted upon the yeah, that's that's Chigwell. Um, Chigwell, okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, yes, I come from Ch <coughs> Chigwell in Essex, which latterly became a sort of comedy cap capital of the UK. But I, I, in all innocence, growing up there, it, it felt like a pretty okay place. But uh, it, it, I. Uh, my parents moved into a new build place there in the 50s and uh, the kind of looped bit of the central line what was was pretty new there um, and and it was like one road parallel and then a footpath acro across rather bucolic bit of a new bit of underground and then just fields carried on after, after that but but it, it it was the soundtrack. It, it was the first thing I heard in the morning and the last thing at night was, was the sound of the trains going by. So, but yeah. you also told me, I think, that there were two ways of, you could go round. Well, two ways of reaching home yes. from opposite directions, mm -hmm. which... Um, yes, I think uh, that's important. I think that's quite nice, yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think ambiguity and multiplicity were built mm -hmm. in from the start. Right. <laughs> yes. Still um, a difficult choice whether to walk from Grange Hill or Chippewa. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so, um, and then... Um, when, when did it first, because the, char the characteristic of the underground as caught by its name is of course that it plunges into the mm. earth and into darkness, or perhaps darkness. Mm. And um, one sees newcomers to London hovering anxiously at mm. the top of escalators. Yeah, Where did yeah. your line first go down? Well, it, well, it, well it, <clears throat> it goes under for a quick snooze at, 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 at Leighton and comes up at, at, at Stratford before then descending... In, into my land, and then yeah, so in, into the, and this, the underground proper, yeah, yes. yeah, so, yeah. And one of the themes um, of your work has been, broadly speaking, journeys, but journeys mm. of different kinds. Yeah. And you've looked in a way at pilgrimage and at um, meanderings, and and so do you want to say something about the relationship to the idea of destination? In in because you've talked about seeing the crowds moving. Yeah, I think I mean in. In, I mean, in terms of, of, of the underground, it, it's a network and, and, and the destinations of everyone are mysterious to each other, but everyone's individual journeys are, are well mapped and they follow the thread of their lives on the whole from home to work and, and back again or whatever. But, the, the, you know, both are some kind of goal. But, but I think... You know, Public transport, in particular, I, I seem to keep returning to, and I think you know, there's the, the transport and there's being transported, and and I think there's something kind of marvellous about um, the underground and our sense of the civic and our our feeling of being comfortable within that environment, jammed up against millions of other mm -hmm. people, that, that that one feels safe enough to fall asleep. I, I made a work called The Unconscious, which is um, web pictures that people have taken of other people to sleep on, on public transport and, and there's something yeah, something in that uh, that, 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 that speaks to kind of a, a kind of connectedness a, a kind of community of souls that isn't really kind of talked about generally in, in, in terms of and, and I think the underground demonstrates something you know, rather marvellous about London in particular um, and, and, and cities in, in general, that, that there's this kind of um, tacit, almost kind of contract you make with your, your fellow citizens. And, yeah. Yes, it's very unusual proximity. I mean, in the morning, one is really, mm. really close to people, and, and that's observed with great decorum on the whole. I mean, yeah, people don't yeah. obtrude. It's very unusual to yeah. find somebody behaving roughly in the tube. Mm. But, uh, but isn't it also that it's a kind of... There's an element of... Of, of resonating with the unconscious, it's partly the underbelly of the city. Yeah. It's partly the city's own id. It's sort of at the bottom there. But it's also when you did your piece, unconscious with all these people with their mouths open, mm, asleep. Mm. The unconscious is also there dreaming. So that, that this is the sort of dream landscape of the city where we're in the dark underneath. Yeah, I think it is, and and it's sort of unknowable, and we kind of know. Um, if there's a collective unconscious, it is that we know that, 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 that Harry Beck's map is, is not accurate, but we can trust to it. So it's like a kind of 
um, we can descend in, into mm. the underworld or into the realms of, of the unconscious mm. and kind of know we can come up out of this yes. hole and suddenly we're, we're there and we, we there's this kind of trust we have because there's no way we can actually think about navigating um, in, the, a in, map. in the belly of without, yeah, a yeah, map. without a map or anything, you know. But um, Picture's gone. Oh, anyway, um, perhaps I'll bring it back. <laughs> There's all this talk about, all this talk about darkness, <laughs> to plunge into darkness. Um, of course, it relates uh, strongly to your extraordinary mapping of the landmarks and stories of the national psyche, and you're able to bring out these these themes. Um, through a series of works of very different um, sizes and very different materials. So um, I think you said that the first time you actually encountered this particular form of monument was on a bike ride you made to... Yeah. Yes, no, I, I, um, 30 years ago I, I, I set off from Paris on, on a bicycle and my first... I mean, I finished up in Florence actually, but that my... Uh, first port of call was Chartres Cathedral, and there's quite a famous yes. labyrinth on on the floor of um, Chartres I think we've Chartres lo I think we've lost the picture, which is a bit unfortunate. But which one is it on here? That maybe it'll come back. Mm. Well, yeah, it, the Chigal one is based on it, so uh, see, so okay. it's, it's the one with the kind yes. of crenellations yes. around yes. around the circle, yes. um, and uh, so that's kind of like a, yeah. A Gothic representation, and that mm. represented a, a pilgrimage or a yes, and it's a, a kind of condensed, a condensed walk. A labyrinth yeah, is a yeah, yeah. I mean, as you were saying, I mean, it, it, it's the smallest space one can condense a, a very long journey in a sense. If, yes, if one follows the yeah the channels and the lines, the, yeah, yeah, and and in that sense, it it. it I mean, we might want to talk about how it relates to the more cerebral and, and the more literal um, brain-like uh, aspect. That, 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 yes, that, that, involutions and the, yeah, yes, yeah. biologically you get the maximum surface into yes. the smallest amount yeah. inside our heads, but it's the folds. So this is like the, sm the longest line in yes. the smallest space. Yeah. But it's also, I mean, the, the idea of the, the monumental um, and the underworld um, and the underground uh, is is a very English. It, it's very English, and it belongs, I think, in the repertory of your investigation of the national national interests, national stories, as I said before. And you kind of you've looked at horse racing, and you've looked at football, and I wondered if um, you wanted to talk a little bit about um, the next piece we're going to show, which is Angel, mm -hmm. um, which is that you're taking the idea of the underground. Um, this is part of a trilogy, wasn't it? Yes, yes. I mean, I didn't quite know I was setting out on a trilogy when, when, when I started on this. Um, this was a work made in 97. Uh, um, I, there, was, there was a small budget from the BBC to make short, short films with artists. And I'd started making work that was sort of investigating faith and Christianity in particular and quite how uh, even for agnostics or rather you know weedy C of E people who just write it in the census that, 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 but that, that just how much of the residue of that uh, was the basis still for all our values and also in the face of um, you know the rise of fundamentalism and I felt well I couldn't I couldn't tackle or talk about Islam because I hadn't been raised within that, but, but started thinking about Christianity. And, you know, we tend to think... The, the English are very self-deprecatory because at the same time they're, they're still really rather arrogant and, and they we, you know, sort of regard ourselves as the norm on which everything else is measured. When, you know, Christianity, the, the Eucharist and all that, it's a very peculiar kind of... Uh, Notional way of build, building a, a faith and a belief, and and uh, but I've, at the same time, I've always been rather fascinated with the opening paragraph of John's Gospel. In in the beginning was the Word, and and I thought if 
if you think about it literally, and literally is, is all we've got, the words on the page, and you build a faith from a book, uh, in the beginning was the word, well, in the beginning was language, and we know that language is only, uh, uh, you know, a set of agreed signs, but, you know, it, it has no uh, fundamental link with the, the objects of the, of the world. And, and then I started thinking about, um, I suppose, some of those old stories about records with secret devilish messages recorded <laughs> backwards. And so I formed this idea that um, I would take something that was literally um, about the, you know, the, the, the Logos and, and, and actually learn that whole paragraph phonetically backwards. And so to an idle listener passing through the station, that, that, that it would just be a succession of of noises and, and then the film itself would just be replayed backwards mm -hmm. and and um, you So know. you figured yourself as a prophet, blind prophet here. Yeah, yeah they, this kind seer. of I mean I kind of yeah, I I I called this character of blind faith. I, I wanted the sense that he was talking in tongues, that he, he was overcome with this message that he needed to kind of yeah, bring to the people and and I was thinking, well I need something <coughs> that provides a sort of constant movement or a kind of arena that, that would guarantee um, constant movement and a kind of rhythm around me. And then I, I just thought about the escalators on the, on the underground and, and we approached the London Underground for whether we could have exclusive use of um, an escalator and they came back with um, Angel. Extraordinary, so that's, yes. Yeah. So, um, because it's the, it's the Logos, it's the angel becomes mm. the, the access to the angel. Yeah, yeah. And the word, yeah. yes. Mm. It's extra but also I think, I mean this, because you're going backwards up the escalator, uh, um, you are playing with this idea of angels going up and down, like on Jacob's Ladder. Yeah. And I think it's an important piece, um, that because it's actually this idea that you've often worked with, which is, how to transfigure the banal. Mm, mm, so here mm. we have a kind of transcendent meaning kind of attached to, to the you know, very ordinary experience every day of going down into the escalator. Yeah, and, and yeah, the serendipitous nature of the pun, which is both mm, yes. wonderful and, and banal. Yeah, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. Um, In fact, you, you, you've made this series of um, works called Mark, Yes. Because, of course, your name is the mark. Yeah. Um, and the name for a painter, a name for an artist. Yeah. I, well, I, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and you've painted the... Extraordinary stupidity or forbearance to wait 50-odd years before yeah, mm -hmm. using my name for its punning potential. But, I, yeah, <laughs> it, 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 I got there in the end. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, can we have the first <coughs> clip, please? Um, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. The things were made by Him, and with God's sin was not anything made as was made. In the end was life. And the life was the life of men, and the last shone in darkness, and the darkness took it in its most. I think I mean the labyrinth, which um, is is a is a cipher, is a is a symbol and a cipher, which um, actually in resists the decoding. I mean, it, there, mm. it doesn't really have mm. an alternative a meaning behind it. And I think here you're kind of showing the you're, you're opening up the Gospel of St John to actually, in a way, to disappear. To sh you show its strangeness and its yes. almost gibberishness quality. Yes. Yeah. Um, yes. I mean. Uh, you need, you know, um, um, <laughs> no, there's little bits of it I remember, but uh, yeah, yeah, yes. You need given it, yeah. Um, <laughs> comes back to me in, in, yeah, yeah, in <laughs> my but, but yeah. 
the, the last words are comprehended it not, you know, mm. ironically. Yes, and that's, yes. That's, 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 yes, the that's darkness the comprehended yeah, it yeah, not, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, but I think, I mean, if one wanted to try to be, you know, a broad brush about your work, it is, you're always looking at signifying systems and sort of opening them up, but not to make them yield another meaning, but to give us, ba give us them back in a strange mm, light mm. so that we experience them more vividly. We experience the world, in a sense, more vividly. And I, but the one, underneath that lies a kind of desire to, re to show that there's so much conventional, so much, so much that we accept without actually asking. Mm. And I think the next piece that you did on the underground, um, which is Parallel Lines Meet an Infinity, mm. um, perhaps you'd like to say something about that one. We could, you could yeah, start preparing could... the, um, you, you could start, well I'll just show the two images and you could start mm. preparing the clip please. So these are the two images from it. Mm. I, um, yeah I got to this by a strange, um, strange route actually. I, it's a bit like the, the underground is my playground, and, and I, I get there from another means. So when we were living in Berlin, um, I, I said for this film, I discovered that Robert yeah. Montgomery, uh, actor and director, father of Elizabeth Montgomery, made made a, a sort of uh, a first person film in which he was Raymond in, in the Lady in the Lake. He, the camera was him. Well, yeah, um, uh, and so. Uh, Philip Marlowe, you just saw through his eyes. So this was, yeah. So it was a bit of a tour de force. This is a film, and then I kind of discovered. I don't know, just messing about. The, I, I stuck a, uh, a five Deutsche Mark coin or something in the, in the middle of the screen on the vanishing point, and it just started having this weird dialogue um, with the, with the action, and became kind of fascinating. And and then I suppose that old saw about. Parallel lines meeting at infinity, and uh, led me to think about the underground. And, and I have to say, the underground are very amenable to artists. Always like, just pick that up again. But, but I mean, just back in '98, I think. So we've got access to. I thought, well, what's infinite on the tube? Well, back then it was the circle line, if you like. I mean, they've rather ruined that now. It's more of a panhandle. But you used to be able to go round and round forever, if you like. You know, mm. and. Um, and so, so, yeah. Um, so we shot from the driver's cab all the way around, all the way around, which takes an hour exactly, which was quite pleasing as well. And um, and so the the work itself is is the film projected on a wall, but then the vanishing point is actually painted a black disc on on the wall. And yeah, and this kind of weird dialogue happens in the end and, and, and one actually can hardly believe that the, the spot is, isn't moving so it's, yeah have we got the clip is it coming but I think the main the main thing mm. in a way is that it, it we, we accept this we, we accept this convention because it's a mathematical formula yeah, yeah, yeah. but in fact it's not experienceable in real in reality so the art I, think, actually... I think what we have here is the raw footage waiting for the spot, actually. I, I don't think I've ever had a satisfactory um, recording of this. But anyway, you get the... <laughs> imagine the spot in the middle of that, yeah. Yes. Is it going to... <laughs> there we go. Because it's too dark, you mean? You couldn't show the spot? It's very difficult to capture it, to, like, refilm it. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So you just have to trust me that. Yes. <laughs> this is where... But this is where. The darker passages are kind of, a bit, you know, yes. like early Star Trek kind of, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this yeah. is where Queen Rat appears. The, yes. The, yeah. the Queen, the, the, the huge giant rat who lives in the, in the, in the underground, who, yes. who, if she chooses you, appears as a beautiful woman and then seduces you and takes you away. Um, <laughs> So, um, th th well, this one was also part of Blind Faith, wasn't it, or not? Was it Blind Faith? No, no, no then there was um, there were two further videos. One, one was, um, I was singing, um, There's a Place for Little Children, which is a, a memorial hymn for children, a Victorian memorial hymn, uh, which I, I sung in the same garb uh, at the top of Primrose Hill, but I was... Uh, Inhaling helium, or oh, yes, yeah, yes. yeah. Uh, which gave me the childlike vocals, if you like, and um, 
and then the work called Prometheus, which uh, in which oh, yeah. so each one is a kind of text or a kind of um, that has taken over me. This was Full Fathom Fire from The Tempest, yeah. And I'm, I'm in an electric chair, and um, as I get to Ding Dong Bell, um, the, the, the piece rewinds as if I'm, I'm getting an yeah, a jolt, and it's just this purgatorial mm. loop, yeah. So um, we, you're really also very associated with um, the, the with radical politics, and um, and just the but again in a very quiet and subtle way. And I think Eke Homo mm. um, taking the fourth plinth. This was early on in the history, as the Tamsin said, mm. when we hadn't got used to the idea of, of there being contemporary art on the on the plinth. And of course, all the other statues are of great men, and mm. so. Um, this is the next one. Mm -hmm. Just we'll just show it. I mean, of course, it's a very famous piece, which many of you will know. Hmm. Yeah, this was. Um, I think I was first approached in ninety eight, nineteen ninety eight. Um, the the plinth had remained empty since the um, the square was laid out in the eighteen twenties, whenever it was. And, and it was, it, it should have been an equestrian statue of William the Fourth, but he didn't leave enough money in his will, so <laughs> so it should have been twinned with George the Fourth across the other side of the square. Um, and yeah, finally, yes, yeah, people got together and asked uh, some art, artists for ideas, and there were three chosen. And originally, one of the the three was going to be a permanent work in. In the square, I think things changed after that. You know, the, the, the goalpost moved, but I always feel I need to say that because you know, now it's a, 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 yes, it's a, a continuing platform for contemporary art. Then, then it was the notion of making something that could be a permanent work in the square. Mm. Um, I mean, this is a critique of monumentality in a brilliant monumental idiom, mm. isn't it? I mean, it's a yeah, and it was you know the the, the, the horrors of the, the war and the former. Uh, Yugoslavia were going on, and you know the images from Srebrenica and and all that, and and I was thinking about the the square in terms of it being both both a place of protest and celebration, and we executed a king just down the road, you know, and uh, we were coming up to the millennium, and we had two successive governments who were too squeamish to address the fact that we were two thousand years since the birth of Christ, and and so there was a, a, a dome and politicians going off to Disneyland trying to find out what to fit it with. You know. um, it seemed to me that you know a Christ figure might might be in order, and but it was um, yeah. So so I came up with the notion of a, of a life size Christ figure at, at this point in which Pilate puts him out before the the mob because although I think there, you know there was that feeling of um, impotence um, during the 90s about that war and, and a lack of understanding of, you know, why it was, yeah, what were the politics and the, and the religious tensions that had been sat under the, all those years under Tito and all that, you know, and, and, um, and I just thought, well, if, you know, I'm going to make something that that would, I, I hope, resound for believers or non-believers alike. You know, so this man might claim to be, might make some fancy claims to divinity, but essentially he was as well, um, uh, you know, a leader of a people in an occupied land. You know, that these things um, are kind of, you know, always thus. Or you know, and and who are we to kind of judge, you know, um, yeah, in the square. So, and, and, and I wanted it to be life-size and cast from a real person, but actually in, in a material that seemed like some transubstantiation. So, it's, you know, we know that bronze is a cast sort of thing, but if something looks like it's marble, it's kind of a different mm. relationship, yeah. Well, it became so vulnerable because the life-size 
turns into this tiny figure mm. on this enormous pedestal which, in mm. comparison to the rest. But it also relates, I think, to your um, the, the labyrinth project, and that is that it's the use of the public space to do something for we who pass through it. Mm. I don't know if you would like to comment a bit about how you feel about this development of the, you know, arts relation, to, not only to, the, mm. to place and the public space, but somehow to the, you know, to the idea of the dread word community. I mean, um, Dave Hickey was sort of saying, should art really become part of the mm. community or should we be dissidents within it that are puncturing and attacking yeah. rather than you know, forming, forming feelings for the crowd? Yeah, I think, I mean, for, for Eki Homo, you know, I'm, you know, Obviously, did some research around the, the square, and I mean, the Victorians didn't worry about um, you know whether people wanted, deserved, or needed any of this stuff. They just kind of went on and did it. Didn't they? I mean, there's a lot to criticise them about, but it, it does strike me that the 20th century, you know, in Britain is rather bereft of uh, public art of any great worth or value or, or abundance, actually, and, mm -hmm. and that there's people have been been too. Um, you know, completely correct, polite, mm. um, uh, cowardly, feeble, or I, I don't know what. You know, they, you know, I think there can be a more robust relationship mm, between yes. art and the public. And um, you know, so in the square, we've got two standing figures further down the square of Napier and Bell, these obscure generals from the 19th century, whose families agreed to their removal before the Second World War, but. You know, history in the end, or in, in public spaces in this country, is just things that have hung around long enough. You know, um, you know. So I think, and a lot of piety. Well, yeah, a lot yeah, of piety, yeah, 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 yeah. Hmm. Um, so I think, I think there, but I think there are there are ways of forging different relationships between art and, and, and the public, and that, that haven't been explored yet, or I. I wouldn't know how they would go, you know, but I, I think it's, it's still an arena that I keep stepping into just because, I, I don't know, I think it's, um, I hope it might be worthwhile, once in a while something might be worth doing or seeing out there that, that you don't have to enter the portals of a museum or, no, you know. Well, I mean, the, the White Horse, which is just off Trafalgar Square now, mm. I'm not very far from where Akia Homer was, mm. is such a, an extraordinary attraction. Every time I go past it, and I go a lot because it's next to the library I use, mm. um, there's a happy gaggle of people, all, of, I'm afraid, probably damaging it a bit, but <laughs> riding on it, uh, yeah. holding its neck, patting it, being photographed. I mean, it has a, it, and, and you said that it was something to do with how you'd done the scale that made, makes it this. This kind of yeah, I mean it was, yeah, I mean it's both um, of itself, but also kind of a maquette for this putative white horse that, yeah. that, that um, yeah. yeah, that I proposed and well, I won this competition in 2008. So this this, this was in answer to a brief to make something 50 meters high. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, well, some people do excuse me of hubris, but it's like, just in the brief, you know, it's like kind of, you know. Um, <laughs> and um, I, um, yeah, so so when I got the chance to make a, a life-size work, um, I thought what well, it could, you know, both be, it, you know, itself and stand as, as a maquette for something colossal. And 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 so he's, he's stood on a very, Broad, low, mm -hmm. low plinth, um, and and kind of off centre. It's funny we played around with different plinths, and if you you know if it's too narrow or you try and get some height on it, it just looks like an equestrian statue that's lost its rider. You know, so um, so for it to be itself, it had to be a low plinth, which means that uh, everyone climb, climbs on him. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting is that it's so mm -hmm. such very similitude for this this kind mm -hmm. of monument as mm -hmm. in Eke Homer. That you're taking track, you're actually creating symbols, but you're you're masking the fact that they're symbolic because they look completely real. Yeah. Um, and I think that's a little bit. You you told me that you were interested in that um, 
in terms of things in, in relation to labyrinths, because they are themselves, they're not anything else. They're not a yeah. picture of something. They're not a representation of something. They're, they're, yeah. they're the thing itself. Yeah. And this is one of the sculptures that sort of relates to that. Yeah, this is um, a work called Why that I made for Magdalen College, Oxford. Um, again, again, it was another competition. Um, and... Yeah, I mean, Magdalen College has supplied more Nobel Prize winners than any other you know, institution in, in the country. And um, it's famous for its kind of Gothic buildings and tracery. There's, um, uh, well, there's a painting in its chapel that, that ended up in the Russian Lions. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Which one is it? Yes. It's um, a trompe-l'oeil of a... Of a a small crucifix. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, so so basically, the grounds were available for a sculpture. This is called rather, in a very English way, Bat, Bat Willow Meadow, um, <laughs> and it's just off Addison's Addison Walk, where um, Tolkien and C.S. Lewis and uh, mm. Lewis Carroll used to walk, and, and um, yeah, and this it was to celebrate um, is it 550 years. Anyway, I, you know, so I go into that generational thing and and trees and and that as a notion. And, I, and I've always quite liked the ambiguity of family trees, or you you, you can think of yourself as the, the last little twig, or 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 as the bough itself. You know, depending how objective or subjective <laughs> is your view of things and and there's the willows there and and and, and the river and and it made me think start to think of, of divining and so I came up with this wire figure that was a bit like a divining rod and made it in the sort of proportions of the golden section and then just the thing kind of yeah uh, receded until it, it 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 reached this its own kind of pattern which is a bit akin to the gothic tracery of the um, the main building, yeah. Well, it's branches and it's symmetrical, so it's mm. got some relationship to the to the way that the patterning of, la mm. of labyrinths. Um, so this is a very early one, um, which um, I, I think um, we were going to discuss this extraordinary fact that they're, they're known all over the world and, yeah. and going back into deep time. I mean, there's most civilization seems to have produced. Yeah, yeah. And you, you divided them up into families? Yeah, so, I mean, for... I mean, once I had the idea for the, the piece of the underground, which, which, you know, was, again, was a... Um, I mean, maybe, yeah, most ideas, you know, there's a few dead ends and then there's, there's a moment of, you know, fortuitousness and, and you just, if you're there at the time, it's handy, you know, kind of thing. And... Um, so, <laughs> so I'd kind of first um, proposed uh, for the underground maybe two a series of facing mirrors, round mirrors that, that could uh, sit opposite each other at, at, you know, at certain points at the, on each station. I, but basically, I formed the notion that that for I mean I was approached basically yeah and, and given an open brief. Um, and I set my own task or problem by thinking would it be quite nice to have a different work on each of the 270 underground stations. You know? um, so amazing. But that's <laughs> what the would, branching what would that be? profusion. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. and then, um, then I was playing with spirals. I knew, I knew I wanted to kind of keep to the circularity of the round or and, and just that relationship with yeah, the notion of the tube or the tunnels or, you know, we've got the map and we've got the, the round or and... The tunnels. Yeah, yeah, and the, the, there's not room for a, a brand new icon, you know, I think you have to kind of ride with that language to extent and... Um, and the mirrors are round too in the tube. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I started drawing spirals and the like and then sudden, suddenly I thought, ah, labyrinths. And then... Started looking into labyrinths and, and, as you say, discovered that they are an ancient and worldwide phenomenon. And, and 
then set to try to find as many extant labyrinths as I could around the world. And so, so that eventually for, for, for the underground project, um, we kind of identi identified about a dozen families, if you like. So there's the, the Cretan one, um, which is, um, the Seven Ring Cretan one is at, at Green Park. Um, uh, it's probably the oldest classic it labyrinth. Could go, and then, it could go yeah, forward a bit. Um, is, that, is that? Yeah, I could go. That's, um, we'll go back. Yeah, that that's, one. Yeah, that's yeah. Cretan, yes. Mm. It's, I think that the technical term is universal. There's one yes, class. Yes. Yes. Because yeah. the the underground um, uh, leaflets, which are very very well done actually, mm. try to make a distinction between a maze, which they say has many paths, and you come at a blank wall, and then you yeah. have to go back, and you have to find your way through, and this one, the the, the maze that is a single thread, which is like Ariadne. Yeah. You follow the thread. And yeah. 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 And so I think it. Yeah, and what's nice about that is, although uh, at first sight it looks like a maze, it looks like a confusion, it looks like something you would step into with some trepidation if you just have enough fortitude and faith, uh, you, you will find a way to the centre and, and, and back out again, mm. yeah. I think they overdo it a little bit, the distinction, because I think mm. that actually one does... I mean, I still get lost on the tube sometimes, and I've been a Londoner for, you know, decades. Yeah, And I yeah. think there is... And, and also, I rather liked a quotation, which I think you, you, you quote, you put in your book, in the book, in mm. Martin, that um, Norman O'Brien said, if you want to find your identity, the best place to start is by getting lost. Right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. But I, I think I would, you know... Um, I wouldn't say that, yeah, yeah, that labyrinths are completely analogous to the tube, because you know, it's very easy to get lost. But I, I think it's, it's, to, it's to give people courage that, 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 mm -hmm. that there's enough people to give you help. Yes. So we should look for another family. We had an organic mm. family and a Chinese family. Mm. I, I'm not, you, which one is this? Um, well, shall we go to the I one, think that's the, it, yeah. the psychologist one? Where is that? Yeah, one? this was yeah. If you go back to that one, okay, this one, yes. Yeah, that was that was the first one that was unveiled at, at, at St James's Park Station, which is uh, beneath the, Lon the, the London Underground headquarters, and the marvelous building, and um, and in fact, it was only unveiled for as a, as a, as a sort of photo opportunity, and, and there was a small film being made and, and the, the vinyl was peeled away and the tube train came in and a woman got off it who happened to be a neurosurgeon and said, oh, oh it looks like a brain. And then, and then she said, oh, it looks, looks a bit like Monks the Screen. And um, <laughs> so I thought well, so that was quite good, just as a sort of... Yes, first. <laughs> she wasn't in, planted. In, in passing, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <coughs> you have a different one at bank, don't you? Let's see, go back to... Sorry, we've mm -hmm. got them slightly out of order. Where's the bank one? There. Yeah. 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 No, this, well, this looked like more like a kind of um, a citadel or a... Yeah. Mm. Um, An enclosure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and the minotaur and, and, in the and, middle. Yeah, if not a big safe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And perhaps uh, you should say how they're made, because the the, the, the tradition yeah. of design on the tube has been very has been very respected in the manufacture of them. No, absolutely, no, no. I mean, all that's been a marvelous experience. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, it, I, um, yeah, it was an easy kind of decision to uh, to make to to work with the vitreous enamel, uh, the, all the all the classic signage on, on the undergrounds. Uh, made with and and so we, we went to the the, the factory in, in Surrey that that does all the, the bespoke signage you know and and it's a beautiful process vitreous enamel and 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 the factory is beautifully laid out everyone seems incredibly um you know happy absorbed kind of you know there's a real craftsmanship and care there and each piece was in individually silk screen and you know, and after firing, I mean, what's quite nice is, is the black becomes slightly um, 
raised embossed on, 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 on the surface. And, and so it has a certain tactility that, that has encouraged rather than two people to, to, to trace around with them. I've spotted people yeah, trace around with yes. fingers, which is quite satisfying, I guess. Yeah. Yes, yes, absolutely. <laughs> now I've seen it, indeed. Um, I think that they also, you, you've always shown great interest in optical illusions and in mirror symmetries and so forth. And of course, this kind of cipher can be looked at as either that we're planing over it and it's mm. much, much larger than it is, mm, mm, mm. or that it's microcosmic. And mm. so I'll just go to the um, walnut um, there. That, well, that's not a walnut, that's a brain. Mm. Mm. And then there's a walnut here. Sorry, mm. here. Sorry. So, I'm um, sorry, I'll go back. Um, so, we're, so this is a small version of what might be a large thing. Yeah, I think there's that kind of, yeah, that, that two hemisphere thing that happens quite a lot in the labyrinths and, and you know, obviously labyrinths didn't grow out of nothing, you know, so so I think you know, they probably were around just that, um, you know, human fascination with patterns and, and uh, systems and... and seeing nature and that around, I, I think, um, and, and playfulness, draw, you know, a way of drawing a path that, that, is, that winds in and winds out and, and, you know, is home at the centre or at the entrance or, you know, that kind of thing. So, and also, yeah, the kind of playfulness, as you say, about... Um, well, I think, Marie, you should mention your Dido and Carthage uh, <laughs> story that you... <laughs> well, I was just telling Mark that uh, when Dido founded Carthage, she told the African king who was giving her the land that she only wanted it to be covered by an oxhide, the, the size of an oxhide, so he said, fine. And she then cut the oxhide into a very, very narrow string, and she marked out the ground with this very narrow string. It, 